Greetings today from Berean Assembly. If you have your Bibles this morning, I'm going to ask you if you would turn with me, please, to the book of the Revelation, the last book of the Bible, the Revelation. Uh, it is not Revelations plural. I know a lot of people mispronounce that book and they say the book of Revelations, but it's actually just the Revelation. It's one Revelation. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ given to the Apostle John while he was on the Isle of Patmos. And so if you would turn with me to the Revelation chapter 22, the book of the Revelation chapter 22, and I want to begin reading to you from verse 6. Revelation chapter 22 and beginning in verse 6. John has an angel speaking to him and showing him things, and we pick up in verse 6 toward the end of this book, and, it's, and, and John writes this. Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servant the things which must shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, see that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Don't seal up this book. Don't seal up the words of the prophecy of this book because the time is at hand. Imagine the angel telling John that nearly 2,000 years ago in the early 90s AD. And then verse 11, let's keep reading, says this. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root of the offspring of David, the bright and the morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come, and let him who is thirsty come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. And I want to speak to you this morning on a subject that the Lord has given to me that is, um, is the most, probably one of the more difficult and yet more serious messages I have ever brought um, today. And that is, I want to answer a question. And the question is, what on earth is happening right now? What on earth is happening right now? And the reason this is going to be difficult is because I'm probably going to bring some thoughts to many of you that you've never heard before or you've never considered before. What on earth is happening right now? I'm going to share that with you in just a moment, but I'm going to ask if you would to please bow your heads and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, right now I ask for the divine ministry, the working of your Holy Spirit. To minister, Lord, to me, that I'm, I would do no damage to your word, but that I would speak your word in plainness and under the anointing of your Holy Spirit. It is the anointing that breaks the yoke. Lord, it is only by your power that a human heart can be changed and can be touched. And so I pray right now in the name of Jesus that your word, which is already anointed, would flow through this simple vessel right now and that I would be able to speak truth in all sincerity and being spirit-led, be able to speak it correctly today. And then I pray that you would open up the hearts and the minds of your people today. Lord, that every person that hears this message, that you would give them eyes to see and that you would give them ears to hear what your spirit wants to say to them today. 
Father, I know you want to speak to people today. I know you want to shake some people out of a place of complacency this morning. And so I pray in the name of Jesus, would you do a great work by your spirit? This is your time. This is your service. Lord, I'm believing you as well as we open up this service that you would minister to brothers and sisters that are hurting today. We have so many that need a, a, a healing touch. There are many that are, are right now, they're not only dealing with being isolated because of this coronavirus, but Lord, many of them are dealing with physical infirmities of other natures. Lord, some are in the hospital right now. Some are at home and they're hurting terribly right now. Would you minister healing to them? Would you minister and meet every need? every need that is represented, Lord, in the audience today. And I will thank you and praise you. And I, I just believe you. I believe you, Lord, for all these things. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. What in the world is happening today? Well, of course, what's happening first and foremost, right in front of our very eyes, is that there is a virus that is literally taking over the planet in many ways. It is bringing economies to a screeching halt. It is um, driving fear, unfortunately, into the lives of millions, if not billions of people. Um, many are, are being put into isolation. They're being told uh, to, to stay at home. Um, the last I read, over one-third of the planet, over two and a half billion people, were now restricted in their movements due to this virus. It's absolutely incredible what's going on right now on the earth today by way of this coronavirus and all of the um, fallout from that economically, socially, um, in, in many different ways. And so we see that there is a crisis on the planet today. And, and yet when we ask the question, so what on earth is happening right now? I want to push back and, and give you a bigger picture. It's not just about the current crisis. There's something greater that's going on. And that thing that's greater that's going on is something that God has spoken about in his word again and again and again. This, this Bible is not just a collection of books written over various centuries or even thousands of years by different authors that is cobbled together um, and, and makes no sense. No, it makes perfect sense. And it has one author and his name is God. And he's chosen to work through various people down through the centuries to give to us his word. And what on earth is happening today is exactly what God said would happen. We don't have time to go back through the scriptures. But what we are seeing today, I believe, is the beginning of the fulfillment of Daniel, the prophet Daniel, especially chapter 9 of his book. And Daniel is a book that is filled with prophecy and speaks of the last days and what God is going to do in the end times. I believe with all of my heart that what we're seeing today is um, the beginnings of the fulfillment of what Jesus said on the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, in Mark 13, in Luke 21. All of those speak of this uh, Mount of Olives teaching from Jesus concerning the last days. There's no doubt about that. That's what's happening on the earth today. God is fulfilling his plan. If we were to go into the book of Acts, we would see that God began to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And as Peter spoke on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, he actually said, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Do you realize that the earth has been living in the last days by God's calendar for 2,000 years now? We've been living in the last days for 2,000 years. So many people say, oh, we may be coming up upon the last days. No, we're in the last days, and we've been in the last days, technically speaking, for 2,000 years. Well, that doesn't make any sense. That's a long time. That's a lot longer. Thousands of years is not a day. But you have to remember that for the Lord, a day is like a 1,000 years, and a 1,000 years is like a day, the Apostle Peter reminds us in his second letter. And so we are living in the last days right now. We're living in a time where God has been pouring out his spirit all around the world, and he's, it's basically an open invitation right now for anyone and everyone that would hear the call and would feel the tug of God and hear the gospel proclamation, whether it come through the voice of a, 
minister or a missionary, where it come through uh, a radio signal, whether it come through a television screen, whether it come through a track, however, or whether it come through the voice of a friend that is heard, God right now in these last days is saying, I'm opening the door wide. Anyone and everyone that desires salvation and wants to be saved from this last wicked generation and be saved from what is about to come on this earth can do so. You see, what we're seeing right now is nothing. This, this is just, if you would, um, a, a small dry run. And as we get into the book of, of the Revelation, and I read those last few verses to you again, we'll concentrate on just a couple of verses in that 22nd chapter. I want you to know that the whole of the book of Revelation, as is really the whole of the Bible, is a very simple story. It's the story of God's kingdom and Satan's kingdom. And God's kingdom has prevailed and it will prevail, but that's the story of the entirety of the Revelation. And I believe what we're seeing today with this virus and some of the other things that have happened recently, we've certainly had an increase in natural disasters and many other things. I believe with all my heart, this is just what we call a dry run. A dry run is when it's a practice run before the real thing happens. And I believe that this is a dry run by Satan it's been allowed by God, but it is a dry run by Satan to see, is the world ready for me to introduce my false Messiah, otherwise known as the Antichrist, onto the scene? Is the world really prepared to actually follow this false Messiah? And I'm here to tell you, sadly, that yes, the world is ready. The world is absolutely ready, and Satan is, is taking these dry runs to make sure that this is the time, and this is the time. There's no doubt whatsoever about that. We are on the verge of the Lord Jesus Christ returning for his children. It could happen before I finish this message. This message may not even get uploaded. I don't know. But if it does, I can tell you that even as you're watching it, it's possible that Jesus Christ could come back. That's not a scare tactic. I'm simply telling you the truth. We are on the verge of the return of Jesus Christ. Because you see, in that Olivet Discourse that I mentioned earlier in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, Jesus talks about birth pangs. In other words, before a woman delivers, there are birth pangs that will be coming upon the earth. And he, he lists some of those off for us. And he says there will be wars and rumors of wars. He says there'll be other earthquakes. In other words, natural disasters. And interestingly enough, he also says there will be pestilence. There will be uh, times of plague in the land that will wipe out many people. The book of the Revelation actually speaks of this as well, of, of a, a time of death and plague that will wipe out a vast amount of humanity. Famine in the land, all of these things. And by the way, they are increasing now and they will increase exponentially during the seven-year tribulation period which is the final seven years of this earth as we know it now. And that, the beginning part of that, is about to start any time now. We need to understand that. But while all those things are happening um, on Satan's side of things, I want you to know that God is doing something as well. And this is really what I want to share with you this morning. What God is doing is he is sifting. Everything that can be shaken is being shaken right now. God is, is doing this work where he's saying, my kingdom is the only kingdom that's going to stand. My people are the only people that are going to persevere through this. But right now, there's a tremendous sifting that's going on. Last year, for those that are in Berean Assembly, you know that I, I preached almost the entirety of the last year on addition by subtraction, that that was a big part of our theme last year, that it was time to begin to get prepared by releasing things that were not important in our life and only holding on to those things that were essential for us. Get rid of anything that would hold you back. And then as I began speaking this year, in January of this year, I, I said our word for this year is going to be intentional. I really felt of the Lord that we needed to be intentional in our faith, intentional in our witness, intentional in our prayers, intentional in our life for the Lord, intentional in our faith. And here's what I want to say to you. If you have not begun those things, then you are right now in the most ultimate and serious of danger of missing God's kingdom. I live here in Florida and we have a season um, uh, that stretches for half of the year from June, July on all the way through October into November and it's hurricane season. 
And I'm here to tell you that when hurricane season comes, there are times of preparation. And if you don't do preparation early and you get caught in the midst of it, you can be in really, really bad shape. You have to do hurricane prep if you want to survive should the hurricane come into your area and actually do serious devastation to it. And I'm here to tell you that spiritually right now, God is telling me there's an urgency here because some of you are probably saying, Pastor, why are you being so urgent on this thing of being prepared? And this is why. Because people's destinies are being determined right now not in the future, not a week from now, a month from now. People, people's destinies everywhere are being set right now. You don't believe me? Let me remind you again of verse 11 of Revelation 22. Listen to what it says one more time. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. When I was a kid one day in our neighborhood um, in, in the Tampa area, I was out with some friends one day and uh, there was a new house being built and they had just poured the concrete for the home. And uh, one of my friends was a little bit older than, than I was. Uh, I was not quite a teenager and, and he was a couple of years older than me. He said, hey, let's go and let's stick our feet um, and in the concrete, and let's, let's make our footmark in this concrete. Maybe we'll write our name. And, and even then I thought, no, we don't want to write our name because uh, that'll give it away who we are. This is our neighborhood. And he said, okay, yeah, but let's, let's stick our feet in the, in the concrete. Let's have our uh, um, uh, Converse shoes, whatever shoes we're wearing, our tennis shoes, and, and let's stick those in the concrete and make a impression. And sounded good to me. I'm a kid. I'm listening to, to this, this older uh, teenager. And I said, okay, let's go over there and do it. And there were a few of us. And, and he said, now, when you stick your foot in, they just, they just poured this and they just left a little bit ago. Um, and it's still setting, but you got to push it in good and hard. And so I go and I stick my foot in, into that concrete, one foot straddled, uh, on the outside on the dirt and the other one straddled, uh, on the edge of that concrete. And I stuck my foot in good and hard. And then I went to pull it up thinking I could pull it up real easily and I realized I could not pull it up easily, that very quickly that concrete was setting and my foot was having a hard time getting pulled up. And I said, hey, hey, I can't pull my foot up. I can't get my foot up. And for a second, they laughed. And I said, no, listen, this is serious. Come on, help me out. And so they did. They came over, helped me grab my uh, foot, my leg, and finally was able to dislodge that shoe from that concrete with a deep, deep imprint, imprint in it of, the, of my shoe. And um, we saw some other kids coming and we scrambled away. And a few days later, went back by and I actually saw not only my footprint and a couple of other footprints, but then I saw a shoe. Somebody had actually, I think the group after us had come and someone had had the same idea and they had stuck their foot in it really hard and they had left it there too long in the concrete set and they actually had to untie their shoe and pull their foot out and their shoe was left in that concrete. Because see, that is the nature of concrete. It sets very, very quickly. And here's what I want you to understand, that as time rolls on in people's lives individually and in the life of the planet in general, earth in general, Human beings and how they respond to the proclamation of the gospel of God determines their ultimate destiny. And it's not just something that happens in a moment. It's not just something that, that, that people, we think, well, I'm, I, I can wait and wait and wait, and then I can be saved at the very end. No, this is something that transpires and takes place Every time the Spirit of God moves upon our heart, every single time the concrete is setting in, and we have either set our destiny as we are moving towards God and we will be set toward that destiny or we are setting our destiny moving away from God and his kingdom and moving toward the kingdom of Satan. Babylon is what it's called in the book of the Revelation. That's representative of Satan's kingdom, of the kingdoms of this world. In fact, the entire book of the Revelation can be summed up by this 11th verse. Everything is there. It's make your choice. 
And there's urgency there because destinies are being set even right now. See, there is no neutrality when it comes to God and to his kingdom and to the proclamation of the gospel. We make up our mind right now. And so what do we see in verse 11? We see those that are unjust and those that are filthy, and we're told, let them continue in that. And so that's the aspect of the response to the gospel where there is rebellion, rejection, indifference, those are the things that are seen in those first two pronouncements in verse 11. And then the second half of it is, let those who are righteous continue to be righteous. Let those who are holy continue to be holy. Those are the ones that through submission and humility and acceptance actually receive what the Lord has to bring to them, which is salvation through Jesus Christ. And this is playing out today right before our eyes. What on earth is happening right now? God is doing a work amongst all the peoples of the earth and their destinies are being set in place even right now as I speak. And if you say, no, I have plenty of time, you're wrong. I'm here to tell you that is a, that is a false belief. Anyone that has told you or has implied to you that you have plenty of time to make that decision is a liar. They are someone that is not thinking of your soul. They do not care about your eternal destiny. They are not speaking the truth to you. Let me just share with you. When the Holy Spirit of God comes into your heart and, there's a, a, and he woos us, the Holy Spirit woos us, he calls us, he draws us to himself. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, and he meant if I be lifted up on the cross, I will draw all men unto me. When the Holy Spirit comes into our hearts and into a, or comes to our lives, Specifically, when we hear the proclamation of the gospel and begins to woo us, we begin to sense that, hey, there's something more here. Perhaps this thing of God is true. Perhaps Jesus really is the Savior, the Messiah. Those are the times to respond because, see, when we don't respond, the concrete sets in a little more. And unfortunately, our destiny is all the more set. And we move toward that, that final point of Revelation 22, 11, where the unjust stay unjust and the filthy stay filthy. And so you don't have all the time in the world. It is, it, it, it's a, a foolish thing to say, I will make a decision tomorrow. Not only that, not only is it that our hearts get hardened as we move forward, but let me also say to you very plainly that you don't know that you have tomorrow. You might die tomorrow. We don't, we don't, we're not guaranteed anything. We don't know that we're going to wake up tomorrow. That's why the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. And I'm here to tell you that this present crisis is acting like concrete. If the Lord tarries beyond this time and we move out of this disaster, then here's what's going to happen. Some people are going to come through and they're going to be stronger. But there are going to be many that are going to come out weaker and further from God. That this time of not being in church for those that were nominal and were in the house of God just because it was the thing to do because that's what mom and dad did or that's what their tradition told them to do. Some of those people, I'm sorry to say, will not be returning to the churches. Some of them will get used to being out of church on Sunday and they will view Sunday as another Saturday and they'll just stop coming altogether. This is the truth of it. Oh no, pastor, this is going to be a time of great revival. You mean like when 9-11 hit? That kind of revival? Yeah, see, when 9-11 hit, everyone thought that all the people in America were going to come to God and the churches would be filled. And anybody that was with us would know that I said this exactly two days after 9-11 hit. I told people, I said, the churches will be filled for one or two weeks and then very quickly they will begin to empty out and the rebound effect will actually be worse than before 9-11 when it comes to church attendance. And can I tell you something? That is exactly what's happened. All the statistics prove it out. That's not just anecdotal on my end. That is what all of the statistics have proven out since 9-11 that over the last 20 years in America, there has been a tremendous decrease, decrease in those that are Christians and those that come to church. Things are so bad now, in fact, that many denominational leaders have decided that they've set a new standard for what a committed Christian is. A committed Christian is someone that comes once every three weeks. If someone comes to your, your Sunday a.m. service and that's all they come, and they come one out of every three weeks, consider them committed. They're actually, wow, they're really committed. That's how far that we've fallen. 
Why? Because destinies are being set. And every time there's a crisis like this coronavirus crisis, people's destinies are being set. And I say to you with great sadness, I say this sincerely, I know there will be people that will never return to church. After they have left, they will never, ever return to church. I'm praying for my church. I'm praying for the folk in my church. And I'm persuaded of good things in Berean Assembly. But I know for the church world in general, there are going to be many, many, many people that will never, ever darken the doors of their churches again. It's going to be too easy to relax and to lose the good discipline. There are good, positive disciplines, good, positive habits that we develop. Coming to the house of the Lord is one of those, and there will be many people that will never, ever return because they will get out of the discipline of church attendance. Robert Mounts, quoting on this verse 11, he's a Bible commentator, said this about verse 11. The time arrives when change is impossible because character has already been determined by a lifetime of, of habitual action. The arrival of the end forecloses any possibility of alteration. Let me read that to you once more. The time arrives when change is impossible because character has already been determined by a lifetime of habitual action. The arrival of the end forecloses any possibility of alteration. And that's exactly what John is getting at here and what the angel is speaking right here in Revelation 22. You see, this verse alludes to Daniel. I mentioned the prophet Daniel earlier in Daniel chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, tell us that many will be purified, many spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. The angel's exhortation here kind of seems like a, an ironic type of, of invitation. Hey, if you're unjust, continue to be unjust. If you're still filthy, continue to be filthy. If you're righteous, continue to be righteous. If you're holy, continue to be holy. And so what he's saying is those that reject God's word, those that reject these invitations, those that come into the house of God, Berean Assembly or some other church and hear the true preaching of the gospel and they can just sit back and yawn and say, okay, and walk out. It's almost like God is saying you are setting yourself in spiritual concrete. Your destiny is being set right now and you will pay the price morally and spiritually by being set in that concrete. I don't have time to go to it, but Ezekiel chapter three and verse 27 and also Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse nine. These are two verses that you can look up on your own that speak of this process of being set in concrete. Jesus spoke with the Pharisees and he says, it's like the blind leading the blind. There's, a, there's this principle, spiritual principle that comes into play. Remember Pharaoh, if you look back um, and, and you see the situation in the book of Exodus that Pharaoh, uh, when, uh, when God was trying to get his people out of Egypt, um, were told that Pharaoh first hardened his own heart. And then after Pharaoh hardened his own heart, after he rejected the message of God and, and the work of God, then it says God began to harden Pharaoh's heart as well. And this is serious stuff. This is when God gives people over, folks. Romans chapter one. If people deny God again and again and again, that gets to a place where God just simply says, I will give you over. I will give you over. I will give you over. And that's what it says in the book of Romans toward the end of that first chapter. God gave them over. God gave them over. God gave them over to a reprobate heart, to a heart that was set in concrete that they said, I don't care what you proclaim, God, I'm gonna do my thing. And God says, okay, have at it. It's real, folks. It's real. That's why the author of Hebrews says today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Listen to me. He doesn't just say if you hear his voice, he says, but if you will hear his voice, and if you look at that, there's a listening with intention. You see, there are people that sit in church and they listen, but they do not listen with intention. And God goes to speak to their hearts but their mind is somewhere else. They do not focus their heart and their ears and their mind on what is being said. That's just why I prayed at the beginning of this service. God, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Because this is what the word says. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. And I'm not going to belabor the point. Unjust is, is doing that which is wrong. Doing that which is unrighteous. That which is just blatantly, blatantly morally wrong. 
Do we have that in the world today? Yes, there's great injustice going on in the world today, and I will not even belabor that point. He goes on to say, let him who is filthy, in other words, the person who is impure, let him continue to be impure. If you don't think that we're living in the end times and that we're close to the end, can I tell you something? Our country, America, I'm speaking from America right now. America's the number one leader in exporting porn. Folks, things are not good here. Abortion has been allowed for decades now. Drug use is skyrocketing. Sex, idolatry, all these things that the scripture says, this is what drives people to impurity. Again, these things that God says, listen, there's a place for sex. A man and a woman in marriage. God has created that. He's created that institution. That's wonderful. But we always want to rebel against God. We always want to do the opposite of what God wants us to do. And so we have all of this unrighteousness, this impurity that is escalating in our world today. It's everywhere all around us. People watching Game of Thrones, which is nothing but straight up pornography and people in the church watching it. Oh yeah, I'm going home from church. I'm watching Game of Thrones. What? What? Unimaginable that we're at this place. And yet that's exactly where we are today. It's, it's truly unbelievable. I say to you, is it God's will? Pastor, are you saying it's God's will based on this verse for the unjust and the impure to remain that way? Is that what God wants? No, no, no. Let me say it definitively. Absolutely not. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. God is not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever can take of the water of life freely again and again throughout the Bible, there's this invitation that goes out to all that it is never God's will for anyone to perish. So because of this pronouncement is given, do not misunderstand that that is God's will for you. God's will for you today, if you are watching this, I can state emphatically on the basis of God's word, it is not God's will for you to perish. Then why do people perish? Because they have their own free will. There is no other explanation for it. God has given man free will. Just as you and I, if we are are decent people, we would never want to have a robot and, and, and program that robot to love us and then call that love because the robot is responding the way that it's programmed to. Oh, look, somebody loves me. No one would want that. No one wants to force someone to love them. That's not real love if you try and force someone into it. That's slavery. In fact, that's perversion. True love is when two people decide and make the choice to love one another. God loves us, but he's given us free will and we have to make a choice and we can make a choice to follow God and be a part of God's kingdom or continue to follow the world and the things of the world. <clears throat> and then there's some that say, well, if I could only see a miracle. Pastor, I, I hear what you're saying. And if I could see a miracle, then I would believe and I would come into the family of God. Can I just quickly remind you in the gospel of Luke, Jesus told a parable told a story, maybe not even a parable, actually probably a real story because he uses an individual's name, a rich man and Lazarus, and they both died. The rich man went to hell to a place of great torment, and Lazarus went to a place of comfort called Abraham's bosom or paradise in the New Testament. And that rich man was in torment, and he realized that he was going to stay in torment forever, and he asked Abraham, who he could see from afar, there was a great gulf fixed between them, but he could see Abraham from afar. And he said, Abraham, at least send someone back to my five brothers to tell them that this is real so that they'll believe. Send someone back. Send someone back from the dead. Send Lazarus back from the grave. And then they'll believe. And Abraham said to him, you know what? Even if someone comes back from the dead, they will not believe. They have the law and the prophets. And if they don't believe that, nothing is going to convince them. And by the way, interestingly enough, Lazarus did come back. There was a man named Lazarus that came back from the dead. And yet there were people everywhere in Jerusalem and the surrounding vicinity that did not believe. Lazarus came back from the dead and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and many others instead 
just shortly thereafter shouted, crucify him, crucify Jesus. They did not believe. Listen to me, folks. Seeing miracles is not going to change your mind. That, that's not the catch-all. It's a wonderful thing. We believe in miracles and healings at Berean Assembly. Those things have not passed away. We believe in those things and we pray for those things. But that's not what's going to save your soul. Believing in Jesus is what's going to save you. And only believing in Jesus is going to save you. And so then the second part of verse 11, let him who is righteous be righteous still. Let him who is holy be holy still. How can I be righteous? How can I be holy? That's not me. That's not any of us. All of us have sinned and fallen short of God's standard of perfection. The only purity we can have is in Jesus Christ. And that's the offer of the gospel, that we die to ourselves and that, then, that we then participate in the life of Jesus Christ. That's the only purity and holiness that we have. Then our lives do begin to measure up. It's not just um, an abstract principle. God comes to live within. God, by his spirit, comes to dwell within us. We are in God. Our Lord is in us. And we then can begin to live out a life pleasing to the Lord. Not to be saved, but because we are already saved. And that's the only purity that we can have. And it is arrived at only one way, and that is by faith in Jesus Christ alone. It is not faith plus works or faith plus anything else. It is faith in Jesus Christ and only in Jesus Christ. I want to close by saying this to you today. There's still time. If you're watching this video today, there is still time for you. But you have to act now. Delay is only going to harden and set the concrete in your heart all the more. It's just going to set in place. But there's time. But that time has to be now. And that's why the Bible is constantly, there's a constant declaration of now. Today is the day of salvation. Now's the accepted time. I would say to you, if you're a believer today, this, there's no better time than right now during this crisis when we're set aside, many of us, from, from the things we would normally do and we're kind of put in place this is no better time to take spiritual inventory in your life. There's a great sifting that's going on. What on earth is happening right now? Well, it's pretty simple. People are being saved and people are being damned. People are being set in spiritual concrete toward the Lord and others are being set in a place where they're going to simply continue to follow those habits that they have, have put into their life over a great period of time. And very, very quickly, there's going to be no more chance for turning. There's going to be no more chance for God to come in and to break up that concrete and to set that person in the opposite direction towards his kingdom. Today, you have to make your choice. For God's people, I close with this. I just want to remind you as God's people that are listening today. For such a time as this, God has set us. As, as his people, we are here on this earth right now to demonstrate a couple of things, I think, to the lost all around us. Number one, we have to demonstrate faith. We've got to, we, we cannot live by fear, and as God's people, we have to uh, be able to show to others that we are smart. Yes, we are smart. Yes, we are using wisdom, but we're not going to be ruled by fear. We are ruled by faith. Faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why? Because no matter what happens to me in the here and now, this is not the end point for the believer. Heaven is the end point. Eternity is the end point. This is temporal. These bodies are going to go. Our lives are going to fade one way or another in this life, but God has a plan and a purpose for us. And so if you're God's person, for such a time as this, has God called us to demonstrate faith? And then the other thing is to demonstrate mercy. We have to demonstrate mercy to people. This is a, this is a great opportunity for the church to show herself mighty and to be the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. My wife did that just yesterday. We uh, got a call from someone <clears throat> that was needing some help. Did not look like they had the coronavirus, but they were, they were sick with some, some other things. Not the symptoms of the virus, but with some symptoms of some other things. But in this atmosphere, you never know. But there was not even a second guessing with my wife and I. It was like, no, go. Help that person. Go ahead and do that. And my wife did. And the person actually did need to go to the hospital. And my wife drove them to the hospital and dropped them off. And we prayed and we're believing the Lord for this person and for healing. Again, not that they did not test positive for coronavirus, 
But we didn't know that. We didn't know for sure. But you know what? There was no, there was no second guessing of that. There was, we, we have to go in and we have to, yes, we want to be wise. I understand all that. But for the Christian, Jesus, when he saw the lepers, he didn't run away from the lepers. He moved towards the lepers. And as God's people, when there are needs out there and there are people that cannot help themselves, we have to trust and believe God and do that which is right and good. And this is what my wife did. This is what we did yesterday as I prayed with her and helped her in that. And I just want to say to you, church, this is the time to rise up and to be the church. This is the time. We have the mandate. We have the message. Let's go forth and let's tell people about Jesus. And if you're watching today and you don't know Jesus Christ is Savior and Lord. You may know about him, but you don't know him. I beg of you, I plead with you, with everything within me, I say to you, turn to Jesus Christ today. Let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, Lord, I come to you and I ask that you would minister, Lord, by your spirit to brothers and sisters, those, first of all, to those that are a part of the family, the household of God. Would you minister healing to them? Would you minister strength to them? Lord, would you do a, a great and a mighty work in their lives right now, Heavenly Father? Some are in need of healing today. We have some brothers and sisters that are really hurting physically. Would you touch them? Would you bring healing to them right now in the name of Jesus? Lord, we have other brothers and sisters that have other various needs, God, and we pray that you would grant and meet those needs in the mighty name of Jesus. And then I do pray for any that are watching today and they have, have not come into a place of salvation. They do not, they're not a part of your kingdom yet. I pray today that they would turn to you, that they would say, Jesus, I just, I throw myself upon your mercy and your grace. I may not even understand it all, but today I believe in you. I just, I, and, and help me in my unbelief. I, I, I may not have a lot of faith. I may not understand what it means to have faith, but I want to believe and I do believe. Help me in my unbelief. I turn to you, Jesus. I turn away from myself. I cannot save myself. I admit that. Nothing else can save me. But I pray for you to come into my heart and into my life. I believe on you, Jesus. You are Savior. You are Lord. And Father, I ask that there would, if there are any out there that have prayed this prayer, that even now, by the power of your Spirit, Lord, that you would change them. That we could rejoice because, Lord, their names would be written in your book of life. And they could be added to the group of the redeemed, a part of your kingdom, God's kingdom, the only kingdom that will triumph on this earth. Lord, I thank you because I know what's going on and what's happening in the earth today. You are doing a shaking and a sifting and things are being prepared. Your kingdom is coming in its fullness very quickly. I pray while the doors are still open and the invitation is still out that others would come in. And I pray that none would fall backwards out of that as well. But I pray, Lord, and am expecting good things from the people at Berean Assembly, that, Lord, we would lose not a one, but that each one would stay strong in you during this time. We thank you. We praise you. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you today.